Welcome to the Morristown Unitarian Fellowship. My name is Allison Miller, and I have the privilege of serving this congregation as senior minister. Welcome to our online and on the ground spiritual community filled with children, youth, and adults who gather for inspiration, connection, and service. If this is your first time with us, welcome. We are so glad you're here. And if you are among those that I get to visit with more frequently at worship and throughout the week, welcome back. I'm glad you're here too. You have come on an important Sunday when we have the opportunity to be led in this service by my good friend, mentor, and colleague, the Reverend Meg Riley. Meg is the Senior Minister of the Church of the Larger Fellowship, the CLF, an online global UU ministry that reaches Unitarian Universalists within and beyond our brick and mortar congregations and also includes our largest prison ministry serving over 1,000 incarcerated members around the country. Meg is here today to share a message about mass incarceration and about the prison ministry of the CLF called the Worthy Now Prison Ministry Network. And we are going to give away 100% of our Sunday plate to support that essential ministry today. We begin our service with two of our youth, Ian and Charlie, lighting the flaming chalice, the symbol of our faith. Love is the spirit of this fellowship, and, and service, service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Let us open our minds and hearts in a spirit of prayer and reflective meditation. And let us begin with a memorial candle. This week, we light a candle for James Hacker, beloved younger brother of member Michael Hacker. James passed away from esophageal cancer at the age of 66. We hold the whole Hacker family in our hearts in this season of grief. James was a chief mechanic and a self-taught programmer for a moving company. Michael shares that his brother was an autodidact, an inveterate punster, a John Prine fan, a wood craftsman, photographer, and proletariat idealist. James was bright, generous even to a fault, and had many friends. He also displayed strength and vulnerability as he made his way through life after losing both parents as a child and by battling cancer twice before it returned this last time. James is survived by his beloved wife, Tracy, and his siblings, Michael and Mary. May James light the lessons of his life and his legacy of love burn brightly in their hearts. Spirit of life, we pause on the edge of another week of living separated from those we love. Some working from home and homeschooling, others working on the front lines, others find themselves out of work or are retired, and others unable to return home, whether incarcerated, detained, in hospitals, or not yet cleared to return. We pause on the edge of spring and fragrant blossoming, a time when land and sea is returning to wildlife, a time when we are renewing our commitments to mutuality and solidarity, a time when tyrants' vanity and greed is exposed, and a time when recreation seems within reach. We are holding on to so much grief and gratitude, vulnerability and strength, weariness and potential. We pray 
May we feel the presence of what is holy and beautiful, compassionate and wise, loving and true flow through each one of us, our lives, our thoughts, and our deeds. May we awaken and act in ways that center those who are on the margins of society and bear a disproportionate impact in a pandemic. Today, we hold especially those who are living in detention centers and in prison cells, both without adequate access to personal protective equipment and medical care. We name that statistics already show that the rates for positive diagnoses are almost three times higher in the prison population. May they find within and without wellsprings of courage and resiliency to be able to respond to what life has in store. All of these things and so many more are our prayers, meditations, and yearnings. Amen and blessed be and may it be so. Our reading this morning comes from Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. I've come to understand and to believe that each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. I believe that for every person on the planet. I think if somebody tells a lie, they're not just a liar. I think if somebody takes something that doesn't belong to them, they're not just a thief. I think even if you kill someone, you're not just a killer. And because of that, there's this basic human dignity that must be respected by law. We are all implicated when we allow other people to be mistreated. An absence of compassion can corrupt the decency of a community, a state, a nation. Fear and anger can make us vindictive and abusive, unjust and unfair, until we all suffer from the absence of mercy and we condemn ourselves as much as we victimize others. The closer we get to mass incarceration and extreme levels of punishment, the more I believe it's necessary to recognize that we all need mercy. We all need justice, and perhaps we all need some measure of unmerited grace. There is more love somewhere. There is more love somewhere. I'm gonna keep on till I find it. There is more Somewhere I 
I'm gonna keep on till I find it. There is more joy somewhere. Good morning. I'm so glad to be with you this morning. And I'm not going to ask you to think about defining yourself by the worst thing that you ever did. But I suspect that if we did, each of us could find things that we're not proud of, that we would hate to have our entire being reduced to. As Brian Stevenson says, we all need justice, we all need mercy. And he says, perhaps we all need grace. I'd say definitely, we all need grace. We're all imperfect, we all make bad mistakes. And while we all need grace, some of us receive it more than others. You know how it feels when someone gives you another chance, just when you really screwed something up, when someone's kind to you, when you're not being kind to yourself because you just really blew it, when somebody gives you a second chance. Universalism is predicated on the belief that all of us are worthy of love, of God's love, that none of us are created only to be damned. Calvinism said that some people were damned before they were even born, and that was it for them. Universalism says we all have the opportunity through the way that we live to be saved. Every one of our imperfect, fault-ridden selves is worthy of God's love. Certainly Calvinism was at work in the life of Kelly Gissendainer. Kelly Gissendainer made a horrible mistake. She and her lover plotted and killed her husband. Her lover, who actually did the shooting, did not receive the death sentence in Georgia, but she did. And she repented while she was in prison, she had a change of heart. She joined the Church of the Larger Fellowship. She joined the United Church of Christ. She began doing everything she could to redeem herself. She apologized over and over, and she spent her time in prison helping other people, helping their lives to be better. She became a chaplain while she was imprisoned at Emory. And her kids begged for them not to have the death penalty for her because they'd already lost their father, but the powers that be in Georgia don't know redemption. And despite even the Pope asking for clemency, Kelly Gissendainer was executed. Her last words were, tell my children I died singing Amazing Grace, and she did. And the local Unitarian Universalist minister was there to protest and witness, and the Church of the Larger Fellowship and her other religious community grieved profoundly. One of her teachers at Emory, Jennifer McBride, wrote the following. Do we really believe that people can be redeemed or do we just think that those of us who are pretty good, who aren't that bad of sinners, can and should be redeemed? Am I willing to obey Jesus's concrete commandments to love enemies, have mercy and do justice? Do we understand that the good news of the gospel rests on this truth? God's justice is about restoration and healing, not punishment for punishment's sake. Most importantly, do we believe that God is powerful enough to save both the victims and perpetrators of crime? Indeed, that this is what the reign of God is all about. When we look at the statistics behind mass incarceration, we see that Calvinism, not universalism, is at work. A huge percentage of the people who are incarcerated are poor. Almost none of them went to college, and always profoundly disproportionate number of them are Black and brown. It really is as if some people are condemned before they're born because of circumstances to hell, to a living hell. 
when my child was five, they said to me, mom, we don't believe in the mean God, do we? And I felt so proud for a minute. I said, no, honey, we don't. And then I said, but sometimes we really want to, don't we? That is very honest. Universalism is much harder than a judgmental, vengeful God who hates the same people we hate. And yet that's what we're taken to over and over. A God who says everyone has a shot. A God who says we can all be redeemed. It's not an easy faith universalism. And whether you use language about God isn't, isn't really it. It's about who we think people are and what we think life is. So when we look at who's incarcerated, we really can believe that Calvinism is at work in our country, that some people are condemned before they're even born. And at no time has that been more evident than now with, with the pandemic sweeping through our prisons and jails, killing and, and hurting nonviolent people, many of whom are there simply because they don't have money for bail. We read these studies, we read about the ACLU saying that literally the number of deaths because of mass incarceration, the number of deaths from the virus could double in the United States from 100,000 to 200,000. But as they say, a thousand deaths is a statistic, one death is a tragedy. I'd like to share with you some of the beauty and the sorrow that comes to me every day through the lives of the incarcerated members of the Church of the Larger Fellowship. A letter from Kenneth in response to a CLF newsletter with the theme of resilience. I've been a member of the CLF since 2004, and I have just had a really rough time in the last few years. The piece that you wrote on resilience moved me to pick up my pen. I've been incarcerated 20 years straight, so it is a topic I know well. I'm 45 years old and have spent 25 years in prison. This is my second time. The first time I did five. But you know, as I look back, it is clear to me now that I am a spiritual man, that even when I was outside the gates, I was in prison in one way or another, be it the prison of poverty, drug abuse, family dysfunction, sexual abuse, and hunger. They were all prisons to me. Many of these were worse than the actual prison I'm in now, but the one thing that got me through all that, before I even understood what it was, was resilience. I never knew the extent of my capabilities until I was tested by circumstances. I haven't broken yet after all these years, though I've seen several people commit suicide that had even less time to serve than me. I've had to wake up willing to face another day in a place where love is something I'll probably never know and where fear is something I'm forbidden to show. I've had to will myself not to become the beast that I've seen so many lost souls here become. Being caged like an animal will cause someone with a weak mind to become an animal. I came here a drug addicted madman with a death wish. I'm now a down to earth man with a life wish. I can tell you that I account for this transformation by having been introduced to Unitarian Universalism. In CLF, I've found a home somewhere I don't have to worry about being judged or criticized because I believe differently than someone else. I've found a place that gives me hope in the possibilities of life going forward and a place where real love in its purest form exists. Yours in love and solidarity, Kenneth. My life flows on in endless song above earth's land. 
invitation I hear the real though far off hymn that hails a new creation through all the tumult and the strife I hear the music ringing it sounds an echo in my soul How can I keep from singing? What though the tempest round me roars, I know the truth it liveth. What though the darkness round me close, songs in the night it giveth. No storm can shake my while to that rock I'm clinging, since love prevails in heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? When tyrants tremble as they hear the of freedom ringing when friends rejoice both far and near how can I keep from singing to prison cell and dungeon vile our thoughts to them are winging when friends by shame are undefiled how can I keep Sounds an echo in my soul. How can I keep from A letter from Ted. The conservative, evangelical, born-again theology I'd known in the Texas panhandle taught that being gay was an abomination and a straight ticket to hell. God, they said, would not even hear me. Moreover, I could not hope for love in the only way I felt possible. My only slim chance to go to heaven was to live a lie, tell lies about whom or what I loved. You know what? I didn't really care. I spent my time in the disco. <laughs> Man, how I loved the late 1980s and the 1990s. The goth clothes, the bands from Europe, the parties and chemicals never seemed to end. In 1992, I found out that I was HIV positive. I resolved then to party until I died. Maybe if I partied hard, I'd end up in hell. But truth be told, hell sounded so much better than heaven anyway. Sort of like a big old underground club, a rave party that never ends. After losing both my parents, my, uh, my life devolved into addiction and chaos. The Texas Department of Criminal Justice became my home away from home. I mean, being incarcerated separated me from chemicals, but it left a huge void. It became apparent to me that I wasn't going to a fabulous underground rave party anytime soon. The love of this community, it brought me back from despair. Unitarian Universalism changed my life in myriad ways. Most of the hurt anger and distrust of conservatism has vanished and with a year or so left to serve on my violation i am still dedicated to pursuing the life-changing faith the unitarian universalism has helped me develop of course now as i near 50 life seems so very good to me that i'd like to hang on to it hell no longer seems like a possibility 
I believe is that within each of us is a spark, an individuation of the divine. And the creator would never punish itself. I'm still open to the idea of an eternal rave party surrounded by truth, love, and life. Hopefully for that I can get a good table reservation because I just can't dance like I used to. Thank you. Thank you for saving my life, my soul, for allowing me to share my story. Now, aside from the fact that I love the idea of heaven as an eternal rave party surrounded by beauty and truth, I'm deeply moved by this letter. The theological astuteness that's displayed in it and so often comes from our incarcerated members. To say that the creator would never punish itself, what a great expression of universalism, one I'd never thought of. So many of the letters who come, that come through from our incarcerated members help me with my own faith. Indeed, these are the ideal Unitarian Universalists. They are doing spiritual practice because they have to. And they have time, but so do we have a lot of time right now. And I don't know about you, but I'm not always doing spiritual practice with it unless you count Candy Crush. But the kind of soul saving that Unitarian Universalism offers to incarcerated people is the same kind that finds us when we realize we're not alone, that we're accepted, even though unacceptable, in the words of Paul Tillich, that we're worthy now. So much of the life of this program comes through our free world pen pals. And they tell us over and over that they are as saved by these relationships as perhaps the prisoners say that they are, that it's that relationship that matters. Now, just because we say that people are worthy, we're not saying everything that they did is worthy. There are some people who are part of our congregation who have done pretty horrific things. And so if you're thinking about being a pen pal, and I hope you are in this time because we really need more of them. Please know that your letters will always go through Boston and nobody has to know your address and that we don't allow people to ask for money or other things. And there are people there to help you in, a, in our staff, to help you to be good pen pals. It's not always easy, but we always hear from the pen pals and from the incarcerated members how valuable it is. One of our members finally was released from prison and when he emerged, who was there for him, his free world pen pal. So many of our folks, the pen pals are the only contact they have in the outside world because they're moved and they're moved and they're moved again until their families can't see them anymore. And many of them have been there for a long, long time. Another conversation with my precocious child who still does stuff like this to me at 23. But when five, Jai said to me, mom, we think God's in everyone, right? And I said, right. And Jai said, well, God told me to shut up today. And I said, what? They said, well, Khalil told me to shut up and God's in Khalil. And so God told me to shut up. I was speechless. And even more so when Jai said to me, who else is in there? Who else is in there for all of us? Radical, radical imperfection. And so here we are, imperfect people in the free world, imperfect people, incarcerated, locked up, reaching out to one another in sheer humanity, hoping that that connection can save us all. A letter from Justin. I have been incarcerated for 15 years. When I harmed my victims, I thought I knew a truth. But it wasn't the truth. As I grew and began to know myself, my truth began to solidify. And with the realization of the truth came the shame and guilt of the pain I inflicted on innocence. 
Now, knowing the depth of lies I'd entertained, I cleaned house, questioning every assumption and rebuilding the vessel I was to be worthy of carrying truth. I'd lied and lied for so long that the only antidote was radical honesty. Not easy when disclosing my crime could hold a death sentence rather than life. But where the light of truth shines, darkness and lies cannot abide. I'm okay, but within, well, I'm great. I can see the potential I didn't as a child and a teen. I share freely the revelations changing the world, one truth at a time. Today, we are choosing to give away 100% of our Sunday plate to support the Church of the Larger Fellowships Prison Ministry, the Worthy Now Prison Ministry Network, which serves over 1,000 incarcerated members and connects UUs on both sides of the prison wall. I served on the board of the CLF for six years, and I can testify to you that what we have heard today is a tiny fraction of the pen pal and letter writing ministry of the CLF. Over and over, we hear the life-saving difference the CLF makes in the lives of those who are incarcerated. Today, we have an opportunity to support that specific ministry and our siblings in faith. I hope you will be generous with your online donations or your checks. Many may find online text to give or giving through our website the easiest, but we are still picking up mail at the fellowship, so checks work just as well. Thank you for your generosity. It will make a difference. I had tides to control, I had moons to spin, and stars to ignite. And they threw flowers at my feet when I walked through the town. Once upon a time, I had lives to protect, I had rules to change, and wrongs to set right. And there were people at my side, and there were rivers I could guide, I wanted nothing in return. Let me out of here, give me back to the wind. Let me out of here, let me please see the sun. Let me out of here, at least tell me what I did wrong. I'm the king of the world, chief of the sea. High in the wind, at least I used to be. I'm the king of the world, please set me free. Let me remind them of my promise, live my given destiny. Once upon a time I had fate in my hands and the confidence of a million regimes. And they said, brother, you're in charge, we'll follow anything you say. Once upon a time, Father said to me, Child, you are everything that you see in your dreams. And I thought, Jesus, that's the key. There are no walls surrounding me. There are no prisons in this life. Let me out of here. Give me back all my dreams. Let me out of here. Can I please see my son? Let me out of here. Don't you understand who I am? the sea. High in the wind, at least I try to be. I'm the king of the world. Please set me free. I had the power and the promise. Give me back my family. Why are we punished 
for wanting to explore why am I sitting in this cell? I was not challenging the system, I was working for the people, I just wanted to be better. Why am I punished for trying to survive? Why am I locked behind these bars? Tell the children I'll return to them. Tell them someone let them know I will be free. I will not be defeated. I will stand like a mountain. And the road will stretch before me and they'll know it's time to follow. And we'll lift our eyes and raise our heads and face the sun and tell the future I'm king of the world land of the free, high in the sky, the best that I can be, I'm a king of the world, watch and you'll see, nothing can stop me from tomorrow, keep me from my destiny, I'm a king of the world, I'm a king of the world, I'm least I used to be. As this pandemic rages, we know a little bit about what it means to have our freedoms curtailed, but the authoritarian, cruel, inhuman systems that are at work with mass incarceration create lives I cannot begin to imagine. To see the resilience and the hope that shines through those lives gives me hope. We all need justice, we all need mercy, and we all need grace. May we be vehicles of justice, mercy, and grace for one another knowing that together, connected, we are stronger. Thank you.